My name is Tyler Zuba, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the uh, first talk in our lunch series with the Carlson Student Research Space. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're enjoying lunch. Um, please feel free to get up and uh, grab more food if you need it over the course of the talk. We will have coffee coming at 1 o'clock, so that'll get you through that afternoon slump. Um, so yeah, um, so we're happy to host this through the Carlson Student Research Space, which uh, has launched very recently. This is our first big program happening, so I'm very excited to have you all here. And uh, we're happy to partner with the Institute for Data Science and Henry Kautz to bring you this first talk. Um, so Henry, like I said, is joining us from the Institute of Data Science, where he is the director. Uh, and has been here at the university for a number of years. About uh, eight years. About eight years? All right. Um, before, I believe you were at the University of Washington and Bell Labs as well, uh, as well as a stint at Kodak Research. So quite an illustrious career. Um, and so Henry will be here uh, talking with us for a little bit about building a career in research in computer and or data science. So I will let him get to that and pass him the second of two mics because we have to be complicated here. So join me in welcoming Henry. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, very gratifying to, to see a large turnout. So I'm talking about computer and or data science because there's such a large overlap between the two fields. One way to look at it is the, the core of the intersection between data science and computer science is an area called machine learning. <coughs> it's also called data mining. <coughs> Some people call it big data analytics. These are all phrases uh, you've heard uh, in, in, in the press. Uh, another way to look at it is that data science is sort of a larger field that includes computer science together with statistics and together with various kinds of applications in the sciences, humanities, medicine, and business. It's pretty hard uh, to come up with any area of computer science that doesn't at least touch upon data science. So from the theory of computing, or cloud computing, or mobile computing, or programming languages. There certainly are, are interactions uh, between uh, research in those problems and research in data science. Uh, similarly, in, in data science, uh, work in uh, statistics on the computational side, biomedical informatics, in business, an area called operations research, and financial analytics, uh, all again, overlap with computer science to, to a large extent. So this talk will help people um, who are really interested in either field or a combination of the fields. So what is the, the working world um, like out there? One way to do it is in terms of a pyramid of those to try to give an, uh, uh, an illustration of the relative number of people uh, within any discipline who might be practitioners, developers, or researchers. And this is clearly not drawn to scale. The part of this researcher bit should be very tiny uh, up at the top. Not to say that it's any better or more valuable um, at, at all. Obviously, without developers and practitioners, the whole pyramid collapses. Um, but what might these be at a particular company <coughs> or line of business? Let's say Amazon. Okay? Well, the developers at Amazon, that's pretty straightforward. That's like the software engineers who are building uh, all the infrastructure for the, for the, for the website, okay? The uh, practitioners are the people at Amazon who are using the various infrastructure and analysis to make decisions about how to run the company, right? Where are we going to put our next warehouse? What goods should we promote on our web pages, right? So they're making use of both the software you see and the software that's internal that's been created by these developers. The researchers, um, on the other hand, are, are relatively few in number. And what are they doing? They're trying to come up with some new methods, new basic methods uh, in this case, for selling you more stuff more efficiently, right? So exploring new ideas. And sometimes they'll work 
uh, initially on a small internal prototype, then work with the developers to actually try this in practice and actually running experiments. Okay. Most large tech companies, I said, have, have a, a, a relatively modest number of researchers, much larger number of developers and practitioners. Uh, Facebook is another company that has uh, a really top flight research lab right now. Do any of you remember how Facebook's research lab got a lot of negative publicity a few months ago? Yeah, do you, what, what was that? Um, they did some uh, clinical research on people uh, seeing, filtering their news feeds to see whether negative stories caused them to post negative things. Exactly, right. So uh, they were running this experiment that if, if, if you saw more negative stories, then you would start to feel negative yourself and then you know, write more flames instead of, you know, praising things. So that's an interesting kind of social science experiment about, about sort of the influence of peers, okay? Uh, other industry, let's say, say finance, okay? Um, what might be a practitioner in, in finance in the area of data science? Let's someone take a, take a guess. Like, what might you think of? A broker? Yeah, a broker a or a broker or a financial analyst somebody who is using these systems to make decisions, give advice. Um, developers, uh, what might be the, the developer's uh, role? What kind of thing might they build? Make algorithmic trading? Algorithm? Yeah, actually implement, implement the algorithmic trading algorithms. Uh, there's a very big company called Bloomberg, the one that the former mayor of New York City uh, founded. Uh, they're basically uh, a technology company, they created sort of this own proprietary version of the web for finance long before there was a web, okay? And then the researchers are those, uh, you know, crazy guys who, who try out um, new algorithms for trading and new kinds of designs of financial instruments and run simulations and say, is this going to really fly in practice. And when you get in, again, uh, probably like your you know, small brokerage firm is only going to have practitioners. A slightly bigger one will have practitioners and some developers for doing internal software. But then you, when you get up to the, like the Goldman Sachs, then you see uh, the, the researchers. Uh, there's actually one other kind of business where you actually do get researchers together with developers right from the start, and that is often in um, high-tech startup companies where you might have, you know, 10 people and uh, one or two of them are researchers. So I'd like to get a sense of, of who we all are here. So um, as Tyler said, I'm uh, a professor here in the computer science department running the Data Science Institute. I started out in high school with an interest in writing, creative writing and programming back in the days when the input and output to your computer was actually an electric typewriter. Okay, so that's, that, shows, um, that shows my age. Uh, I went through uh, college uh, studying um, uh, math. Um, I really was good at programming, but I felt it wasn't creative enough, so I was also taking these creative writing courses and English literature studying that, uh, but I couldn't really see a career. I didn't want to be an English professor. At some point, I discovered there's this crazy field called AI, again, which is kind of morphed into machine learning now. Uh, it sounded pretty cool. I came to University of Rochester, did my PhD here. Um, went to work for Bell Labs. When I started there, it was the phone company. It very quickly started to split into many different phone companies and um, uh, and so when all the splitting was going on, I went to University of Washington, had a lot of fun there, and then finally uh, moved back here about eight, eight nine years ago. Uh, so people in the audience, how many uh, people here are freshmen? And sophomores? Juniors? And seniors? Okay, so actually the largest contingent is juniors, which is great, because your junior year is, is a great time to really be thinking about um, the steps you should be taking now to plan for a career in, in, in research. Um, 
Has anybody who's like uh, in the senior, has anybody here actually applied to a graduate school yet? No, but you'll, you'll probably be doing that soon, right? Because graduate applications uh, generally are due January 15th. Now, um, actually when I was first applying to graduate school, I did not go for my first couple years to, to Rochester uh, because I didn't realize I wanted to go to graduate school until like uh, the March of that year. So I had missed all the deadlines for American universities. Turns out Canadian universities have a later deadline. So I was in Canada for a couple years. Um, okay, so here's a question to ask for yourself. Lots of different kind of jobs. I said, it's not like a research career is any better. I mean, it's better if you're the right kind of person. It's better for me. But it's, I, I, it's not to say that the world, uh, you know, just needs researchers, right? It needs all kinds of people. So should you go into research? So here's some questions. Can you set your own goals? And does a blank sheet of paper frighten you or inspire you? Okay. And this is a real struggle. I have to say that as a researcher, this is something that I confront uh, uh, frequently. And uh, there was a time in my life where I was really miserable as a researcher because it felt like every day there was that blank piece of paper. What should I work on today? Nobody could tell me. And, uh, and I might work on the wrong thing, right? And that then sort of leads to being ignored. Uh, and so it's not like a, a job where someone is saying, you know, I need you to do this, right? Uh, and it, it gets better with time. I'd say, I said, uh, got my PhD around 30 years ago. And within the last year, year and a half, I've sort of gotten over that fear. Um, uh, <laughs> Mainly because I now have enough really smart graduate students that um, I can uh, just sketch one or two ideas on a piece of paper and let them uh, fill in the details. But I said, but this is, this is a serious thing to think about, right? I mean, are, are you that kind of self-directed? You have to be self-directed. And that's connected to the next one. Is an occasional success worth a lot of day-to-day -day failures? Right? That when most research fails, it wouldn't be research if it always succeeded, right? If it did always succeed, that means somebody's cooking the books, right? Um, so you need to be the kind of person who is not easily discouraged, but is not a crank. You can learn from your failures, right? You're not gonna, uh, uh, you know, as I said, idiocy is like doing uh, the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, where you're going to be doing the same thing over and over again with, with some variations uh, that hopefully will get you that, those different results. Are you okay being surrounded by people who are all much smarter than you? <laughs> okay. Um, there are really scary smart people in research, you know, and, and you're talking to them and they're just, they're, they're just blazing along and concepts, ideas, and, and you're just barely catching up and, and um, they're kind of inspiring but also kind of threatening and, and then you're, you know, it's easy to start feeling getting an inferiority complex and, and the secret, of course, is to know that they all feel the same way. When, when you're talking, they're feeling kind of stupid. Um, uh, and, you know, there, there are different, um, uh, different personalities. Some researchers really are kind of shy and modest and retiring like myself, but boy, it doesn't hurt to have a good healthy ego <laughs> and uh, uh, to be a bit of a promoter. And then finally, the last is, well, what do you think the most important thing that you can do in the world? And if you can say yes, the most important thing that you think you can do is to expand the body of human knowledge, go into research, okay? No, that's, that's a nice value. There's other very good values. Um, eliminate human suffering, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, help, you know, save the world from global warming. Those are all things that could connect, you know, t uh, uh, to this, but maybe you should really be thinking more in terms of the practitioner, developer out there in the world, running the country, you know. Uh, but uh, you have to really feel that there's just something inherently important about even making a small contribution to human knowledge. So one thing I should say, by the way, is, is please, if, if, if 
uh, you have, I, I, we'll have discussion at the end, but we, I, I already halfway through my slides, right? So, so please feel free to, you know, hold up your hand or, or just make a comment, shout out something. We have, we have plenty of time. Okay. So, uh, why do you need a PhD? So I'm going to say you probably want a PhD if you want to be a researcher. You will find cases of people who are successful researchers who don't have a PhD, but they are, they are awfully rare, awfully rare. Um, when I was at the University of Washington, uh, the person who's, who's now chair of the department, uh, Hank Levy, uh, uh, at the holiday party, he would always do a skit called um, Ask uh, Mr. Sci uh, Mr. Science, he has a master's in science. And the reason that he did that skit is he never finished his PhD. Nonetheless, he is an extremely well-known researcher and head of one of the most powerful computer science departments in the country. But you can, you can literally count those kind of people on their, their one hand. So why, why do you need a PhD? Um, well, it's about learning. A little bit of it's about learning stuff that you didn't get to in your undergraduate. But by and large, that's not the main thing you learn. If you just want additional stuff, you go get a master's degree. Okay? First, you learn how to learn on your own what you need when you need it. Okay? That no matter how thorough your degree program is, no matter how rigorous, no matter how many times you overloaded on, on courses, when you're actually doing research, um, it turns out you need to know other stuff. And you need to be a quick study. Uh, you need to go out there, uh, search the web, search the library, read a few papers, and <coughs> learn the new material when you, uh, when you need it. When you're working with your advisor over that course of four or five, six years, one of the other big things you learn is how to create a research question. So what will your, your PhD project address? A, a problem <coughs> that is significant and is not too broad and not too narrow. Okay, it's, 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 a real, it's a real challenge. This comes back actually very similar to that blank sheet of paper. How to set the right question you're going to work on. And then how to carry out research. And I look at this when I talk, work with my own students. Um, learning from failure, right? And the, the star students are the ones who figure out how to learn from failure. And, and they can distinguish these three cases, right? That your experiment failed because you had bad technique. Your data collection was sloppy. You, um, you didn't look for outliers in the data, OK? Uh, you, um, you, you use some method improperly. Uh, the second is, is having, having a, a bad method, uh, trying to say, well, you're solving, the problem you're solving is right, but you're going about it with the wrong mathematical or computational approach. So for example, in the world of machine learning, there are a number of different algorithms for machine learning, right? That, that you could learn about. And if you take the data mining or machine learning course, courses, you'll hear about support vector machines and neural networks and logistic regression and all these other things. Sometimes you just need to get a different method. Um, and then the other important one is a bad question. Your work is, is failing because your question, in some sense, is ill-posed. OK? It doesn't have a good answer. Right? You, you have to think more carefully about refining the, the question you're addressing. And then the final piece you'll learn whoo, is how to effectively com communicate um, complicated new information. So as I mentioned, I was an English major. And so I got used to writing you know, long essays. That's, that was a huge help. Uh, just to be able to sit down and um, write down an outline to, to convey an argument um, in, you know, five pages, very complicated things, and it has to be coherent, right? And you have to lead from idea to idea and know when to include 
a specific example and then step back and talk about the general case, right? So, uh, you know, learning this skill, uh, there's often not enough time to do this just in your computer science courses because, yeah, you, you have an upper level writing course you might take, but you really need lots of practice at this. So um, uh, at your undergraduate level as well as when you're in, in, in graduate school, uh, well in graduate school you'll be writing you know, scientific papers with your research. As an undergraduate though, I always encourage students, um, you know, uh, courses like history, courses like philosophy, uh, 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 you know, literature courses where you really have to learn to break down an argument and communicate it effectively <coughs> are great preparations. <coughs> okay. Now, what kind of PhD should you get? Right. Now, I'm going to, for this slide, um, I'm talking uh, with my own subjective opinion that others may disagree with. So, uh, computer science. Uh, well, oh, this is actually pretty objective at this point. It's most in demand. Uh, rapid growth in industry jobs uh, that are good for a PhD, as well as, as fairly moderate growth in university jobs. But at least there is slow growth in university jobs. Um, now, one thing I say um, most in demand, <coughs> Probably part of that is that uh, of the <coughs> roughly, you know, about 800 PhDs that are granted in computer science in this country every year, uh, Google hires about 200 of them. <laughs> so, <coughs> so if Google stopped hiring, that'd be a big change. Um, <coughs> the, the other thing that kind of skews this is that a lot of the people who go to Google um, with a PhD end up doing development rather than research. And they end up happy, but uh, essentially when you're hired by Google with a PhD, uh, they're making you an offer and then they try to match you with a research group, right? And uh, so you're, you can be put in a funny position with Google is, <coughs> I can go to work for Google with a great salary, but I'm going to be sent to a development group uh, rather than a research group. Um, as I mentioned, data science also includes statistics. Now, there is no PhD in data science, per se. There's not, that's just not a thing that exists. Is that you can do computer science and essentially do this machine learning data science thing. You could go into a statistics program. Uh, there's a pretty good demand in industry. Uh, pretty, not probably quite as great, uh, but much slower growth in university jobs. So it would be, um, more challenging to get a university position. Okay, now here's where I'm going to start to get into trouble. Um, the physical life social sciences. So I said data science kind of incorporates the applications of computational methods to a wide variety of, of disciplines. And you can do uh, a, a major or a minor in data science with a concentration, let's say, in biology or business or whatever. Um, the PhD job market, as it, it's, it's generally pretty difficult in, in terms of getting a, the, the, a job that really makes use of your PhD skills. And in fact, um, if you really want to go into research, your PhD is usually followed by two to four years of being what's called a postdoc before you get a real job. So in some sense, that's an additional a period of time spent uh, like, like a graduate student. Um, now there are certainly exceptions to this. There, there, are, there are, are certain niches uh, uh, where, boy, that's a, that's a, there, there's both academic and industry jobs for PhDs in that specific area. Actually, right now, uh, uh, a great one uh, is photonics, that, that the, um, uh, the School of Optics here could not turn out enough photonics PhDs to anywhere fill uh, uh, the pipelines. Um, but it's, this can also be, it's been historically pretty volatile. So a few years ago, everybody was hiring in biotech at, at sort of the research level. And there was sort of a biotech bubble. And then uh, things pulled back. So 
I said, so please don't tell these other faculty members <laughs> that I'm bad-mouthing their fields. No, I have great respect. Um, but I said, this is just my view of, of what I see in terms of, you know, if you want to really think of yourself as a, as a data scientist, um, you might, you know, said, so, so let's say you are a data scientist, you want to be a data scientist with a concentration in biology. You might want, I think you're better off in terms of the job market of getting a PhD in computer science uh, in, a, in a department that has a close collaboration with a biology department as opposed to getting, doing it the other way around and getting your PhD in biology with a minor in computer science. The yeah. Job market, is this specifically for data science or is it just like uh, I, Well, I think it's probably pretty more, more general. Um, uh, I, I am thinking in terms of data science uh, because I, and I'm not an expert. On, on these other areas, but uh, I said when we've, when we've, you know, do, uh, when I've seen searches like for people in computational biology, um, you, you just look to see, well, who are the people who get snapped up uh, us kind of first? It tends to be the ones with the PhD in computer science who worked with biologists rather than vice versa. Um, here's where I'm really going to get in trouble, uh, business. Uh, you know, actually, business schools are declining nat um, nationally, um, and very few people get a PhD in business. So, so the, the real, the main degree there is like an MBA or a master's, and so the PhDs really only go to date to, for academic jobs. But the schools, you know, they're they're no longer growing. So, I, I would advise you to start a company um, instead. Um, I said, but again, people at Simon School might get, get very mad at me. Yes? That's, that's a great question. Yeah, so wh what about math? I think that, um, like, like with statistics, you could actually do fine with a mathematics degree as long as it has a, um, a computational component and that you can, um, uh, you you basically be working on the right kind of problems. So uh, a, a PhD in applied mathematics, actually those, you know, and, and you show that I not only know all this good theory, but I can um, uh, apply it, you know, to different kinds of, of real world problems. Yeah, that you're, you're, you're in great shape. If you are doing though, of course, like pure number theory, um, then uh, you're, 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 you're back into this situation where you're chasing after a small number of purely academic jobs in a, in a f that are, that where that pool of jobs is not growing. Um, and just as an aside, the American university systems are kind of, um, we're kind of a, a, uh, entering a crisis time where um, uh, it used to be you'd go to a university, if you're good enough, you get what's called tenure, right? Which doesn't make it impossible to fire you, but it makes it almost impossible to fire you. And until a few years, until about a decade ago, um, then you were expected to retire, uh, you know, at about 70, at the age 70, okay? 65 to 70, you, ha you had to retire. Uh, but then mandatory retirement is thrown out. <laughs> and so now jobs are not opening up, and there's been what's called the grain of the university. Uh, I was just reading a little article that they did a, a study at Cornell, uh, one of the world's great universities, the average age of a faculty member is 62. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't see these, I don't see us going to mandatory retirement anytime soon. So it's, so the only ways you're actually getting new faculty positions, except the small number of people who finally, you know, die in the harness is, um, <laughs> Uh, is when, when an apartment is actually growing, you know, when they're actually, uh, universities are creating new positions. And, and uh, here's, here's another good practical piece of advice. Should you get an, an MS first, Masters of Science uh, first in one of these fields? I said, my general advice to someone who wants to get a PhD is no, unless one of these things. Your undergraduate degree is quite far from computer science or data science, okay? So your undergraduate degree um, you know, is uh, American history, right? Um, and you've taken a few computer science courses, but you know, it's it's not a uh, a really it's not like a really substantial thing. It's not like a double major um, or a minor. 
So then, then probably it's a good idea. Uh, you, know, you need to be able to show that, that you can do that kind of work. Um, you have a major, in your major courses, your GPA, well, GPS, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, GPA is, uh, is less than about 3.5. Um, and I'll talk more about that GPA issue. And you don't have any undergraduate research experience. Um, that's, that's kind of a killer combination. They're, you wanna, they're looking for like 3.5, 3.6, 3.7 um, GPA to get into a PhD program or research experience or both. If you don't have either, then yeah, makes sense to go um, uh, and I said you'll be paying for a master's degree. Uh, third thing is your, your Bachelor of Science is not from a US, Canadian, or European university. So, so you're, you're ahead of the game here in this room. Uh, but often a, a Bachelor of Science in, in almost any STEM field with some good strong programming courses can get you into a decent computer science program. And as I've noticed that physics is particularly good, that, um, uh, that uh, you, s you find a lot of, of CS PhDs who did a physics as an undergraduate. And I, and I don't know if it's just because when you're a physicist, uh, you both, you get this sort of sense of dealing with both numbers and the messiness of the real world, and you just have to be bloody smart. So um, uh, I, I've actually tried once to, um, I was talking to some physics, some people who just were getting their PhD in physics, and they were saying about how they were about to uh, go off and start on a, uh, on a postdoc, and how they probably would have to do a couple postdocs. And I said, well, listen, you now know how to write a PhD thesis. Come and be my graduate. Get a second PhD in computer science. We'll get you, get you done in three years, and you'll be great. But they <laughs> didn't go for that. Um, I can see, getting to your second PhD, you know, actually if you got your PhD in physics and uh, just learn a lot of programming on your own and then, you know, go into Google and say, damn, I'm not being a developer, I'm being a researcher. Um, and, and that can work. Um, so where should you go for your PhD? So let's say your goal is to be in an industrial research lab, okay? It'd be great to be, go to a top um, a 20 department. Now, how, do, how are these rankings done? Um, unfortunately, <laughs> there's US News. It's not highly reliable outside the top 10. There's a lot of noise in it. So it's best to use that as a starting point and then go get advice from your professors, okay? Um, there's an organization called CRA.org. They have uh, information there about uh, all, there, it's a membership organization of all PhD granting computer science departments in the, in, in the US. Um, and you know, I think it's about 133 schools and they're all, they're all decent schools, right? Um, I said, but even, you know, you could go probably to number 100 and, and still do, you know, pretty darn well. Uh, it, a lot of it just comes down to the quality of the work you do and um, again, the, you know, you are more likely to find a strong advisor at a highly ranked school, um, but there are exceptions, right? So, so it's a good idea to actually be looking at, at the schools at particular advisors, right? See, do those advisors, are they doing exciting work, getting lots of publications? Are their students going to uh, good places? Uh, suppose you want to get a faculty position. It's, it's a very sad truth that there's essentially 10 departments whose grads fill about the, the majority, that's about probably 80% of all faculty positions uh, nationwide in, in computer science. Um, however, there are some lower ranked schools that are very successful, and including the University of Rochester. <laughs> you can actually go onto our website and, and see the list of faculty from Rochester who now have academic, I mean, students who now have academic uh, appointments. There are also schools that you know, are full of good faculty, but maybe one student in the history <laughs> in, the, in the last 30 years has ever gone to an academic position, right? So uh, again, so you're gonna have to do some of uh, your own data mining. So look at the track records of the particular school and the particular professors. 
Any questions there? Financial considerations. Uh, most of you know this, but if you don't, this is great news, is any PhD program um, should give you full support, meaning you um, uh, are going to get a stipend of about $25,000 a year, okay, and you know, you don't pay tuition or anything. I mean, it's, it's, it's great. Now, and, and what I found, you can live amazingly well by living like a student, you know, because you're a grad student. You're not expected to have a house payment or a car payment or all kinds of other <laughs> payments. So your money, um, uh, uh, um, you know, is, um, it's basically all spent on, on having, you know, a good time. Now, now the, <laughs> the, um, the, the one, I guess the one exception is, is well, what if, you, what if you already got married and now have kids, right, and are doing this? It, yeah, it's, it's harder. So it, 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 certainly, uh, uh, it certainly helps then to have a spouse who can bring in the, the big bucks, right? But um, uh, I, I, I follow the tradition as I got married the year I got my PhD, you know, that, okay, we're, we're out. Um, uh, gone out with the same woman throughout all that time, but <laughs> we, you know, kept things uh, separate. So, um, so you don't need to save up money for a PhD program. Uh, you might wonder, does paying for a master's degree at a particular university ensure that that university will then admit me as a PhD student? That's well, a simple answer, no. No, yeah. Only do the master's route if you need that further preparation and then be prepared to apply very widely. You, know, you might hit it off with a particular professor there who then takes you into their master's program, but there's usually no preference. Yes? So are you saying that if you don't want to get a PhD degree, there's no point getting a master's degree? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <clears throat> getting a master's degree is great if you want to get, if you either didn't do your uh, undergraduate degree, let's say, in, in, a, in a STEM field, um, or you want to get a better job in, as let's say, a developer, as a software engineer, then that, that's, what a, that's a perfect uh, credentials to be like a, to be a high level, you know, uh, uh, the kind of software engineer who isn't just doing program, but is like leading a big team of people, okay? But it's very unlikely with that with just the masters that you're gonna enter that world of research except in a support capacity. Okay? Other questions? Um, should I work for a few years before going to graduate school? And uh, this comes down, I uh, say, do you need the time to figure out what you want out of life? And it's, it's Entirely, it's it's a it's a fine thing to do. I mean, you've been in in um, in in school uh, for a long time. Uh, for most of us, it's probably good to go out and face the real world. Um, that's what I did. I quickly discovered the real world um, was not quite as much fun as graduate school as, as school. Um, so I went back. Um, the, um, the the on the downside. Um, if, if during that time you started to live like a normal person with a house and a mortgage and two cars and a dog and whatever, it'll be harder to go back to living like a graduate student. And the second is um, your work experience really only counts for admission to a PhD program if you did something amazing. You know, if you, you went and worked for some startup company and you created some new app that lets you put hats on dogs, you know, in pictures of dogs and um, something like that, something that, that sort of got people's attention. You spent that time or you contributed, you know, a million lines to some open source project, right? Uh, if you just worked as an ordinary software developer, unfortunately that, that doesn't seem to be usually taken as, as a big benefit for a PhD application. But here's the most important factor, which of course is why we're here. It's all about undergraduate research these days. So um, what do I mean by undergraduate research? It's not about just showing up at the faculty members group meeting. 
Okay. Uh, you need to really first find a faculty member who's doing work that excites you, right? Uh, you know, go look at their papers. You don't have to understand every word, but, but you know, read some of and say, it's just, does this seem really cool? Um, does this person publish papers with student co-authors? You're going to ask, ask around. Uh, who are the ones who are working most effectively with undergraduate students? Second, I'd say go above and beyond what is asked of you. Okay? If a professor asks you uh, to, uh, could you um, fix this program and run it on that data set um, and have the results by next week, um, have the results back in three days together with a nice graph and a short report on, on, on how you did it and the problems you ran into. Okay? Um, and, and, that, and that's also great, is communication. Provide, it, it will help you keep track of what's going on and, and also will make it so much more valuable for your, your mentor. Provide clear write-ups of what you accomplish. Okay? Document what you're doing. Uh, advise you to try to be a strong student in foundational courses, uh, usually first. So um, one thing that that's can be a little bit challenging for me as a faculty member, um, someone who's a freshman wants to do AI research with me, but they've not, they've only taken 170 on only a single computer science course, they've not taken the AI course. Um, they, they don't come with any of the um, uh, sort of necessary skills for them to sort of jump right in. So I would ad advise you, um, if, if you can get a job you know, just sort of helping out, um, that's fine, but the, the time to really put the push on is, is maybe, um, you know, either in your sophomore year, depending upon how accelerated your freshman year was, or in, in, in your junior year. Now this is a little bit different, I think, for computer science than um, some of the physical sciences, where there's just a lot more um, repetitive manual tasks that need to be done, <laughs> right? So, so as a freshman, you can do a hell of a job washing test tubes and pipetting, right? But uh, there's not that much to be done uh, as, as a freshman, again, unless you had a lot of experience in high school. Yeah? So when should, uh, when should an undergrad student consider, consider those, like, talk, uh, talk to professors about joining Yeah, well, um, so I would, uh, I would say uh, you've, the, the first two courses are 171, 172, okay? Do very well in those, and then the best way to get a, um, uh, you know, I would start, uh, let's say, partway through my sophomore year if I'm doing really good in a professor's course, right? And I, I seem to actually have a talent for this. So um, I would say maybe starting in the, uh, start talking to them at the end of the, uh, end of your first semester, sophomore year, talk to them, you know, maybe get started during your second semester, sophomore year, and then sort of, but or, you know, or start during your junior year, okay? I think that's, that's kind of, and again, there can be exceptions. If you, if you have a particular unusual skill, right? Uh, we had this one student a few years ago um, who knew everything there was to know um, about Adobe Flash, and he, <laughs> he, he picked this up on his own in high school, and he immediately contributed to a bunch of different research projects back you know, nobody uses Adobe Flash now, but at the time it was sort of a critical, he had this, this unusual skill. And, and I would say, like in your junior year and, um, you know, that first part of your senior year when you're applying is make it your highest priority. And um, so I said, you know, 2.5 GPA, but published research papers and great letters from your advisor, which is going on and on, that can get you into MIT. I've, I've seen it happen. Um, of course, it's great to also have the 3.9 GPA and those other things, but I literally have seen a 2.5 get into MIT. Um, well, I said, and yes, the GPA is important. Uh, I'd, I'd advise people, beware of overloading courses. Um, it's hard to do great in everything, and part of, I said, the PhD education process is just-in-time learning. You'll never take enough courses. <laughs> so, um, 
And if you're overloaded, you don't really have time for research. So I'd say uh, take fewer courses and, and do better in them. If you must overload, you know, take some pass fail. Uh, okay, you've started talking to some professors, maybe the second part of your sophomore year. You showed up at their, at their group meeting, did a few small things for them, um, and then you talked to them. So now you can actually take your, uh, your research experience and actually turn it into an independent study. Okay, so actually take that uh, for, you know, for four hours of credit. Do a serious, a serious effort, like you know, said you're during your junior or senior year, and then only take uh, three other courses, right? So um, you have, have less, you can really concentrate on, on that research. Um, another great thing you can do is uh, your research experience doesn't necessarily have to be here at Rochester. There are these things called REU, Summer Research Experiences for Undergraduate. NSF uh, funds these at universities all across the country. Um, there were a couple in data science this past summer, one at Carnegie Mellon, one at University of Washington. And you just applied, and um, one of our students went to the one at Carnegie Mellon, had a great time. I'm sure that will uh, be a big uh, boost to his career. And, and, and the only thing I would say is, is the same comments as for doing the research here. Give it your all or stay home. Um, I've sometimes have been, I've interviewed students um, for graduate school, and uh, you know, they, they listed on their CV they did an REU. You know, so I'm sitting there talking to them and find out, uh, tell me about what you did. And um, they didn't really do much. They, they kind of, um, uh, sounds like they weren't really engaged with it. And then that, that disheartens me. So it's like better not to have even told me about that <laughs> than that you had this opportunity and you didn't make a lot out of it. And say, um, final advice, final advice. I guess we are, okay, so it's about coming up in a good amount of time. Not all universities require the graduate record exam, but it doesn't hurt to have a near perfect quantitative score. Uh, plan to take it twice and take a, a GRE prep course. Another reason to maybe not overload on courses. They really work, it's scary. Um, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, you can, I've seen it time and time again, um, including my own daughter, <laughs> you, you take these prep courses and you can uh, uh, boost your grades on those. Um, and the final piece of advice, if you can keep it in your mind until the, the t year that you finally apply. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll make these slides available. I might I'll have to think about that one where I seem to be dissing other disciplines. Um, your application essay, it is nothing like your undergraduate essay, okay? It's not about showing you as a whole person, right? That, that the, uh, when, when, you, when a, a department's sitting around looking at applications for graduate school, right? And, and somebody says, you know, okay, the person got interested uh, 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 by playing with Legos. That's how they got interested in, in um, you know, technology, <laughs> you know? We, we don't care. Um, what do you, we, we want to, because we don't really want a whole person. We want a person who's, who's going to do great research and make us look good. So we want to see clear goals and clear accomplishments. Um, and final thing is, is just be generally aware of what's going on in the research world. And this is so much easier today. Um, you know, follow the research pages of, of various universities and uh, research labs. Follow famous scientists on Facebook, okay? So right now, um, here, here's an assignment. Um, the the uh, head of Facebook Labs is a guy called Jan Lacoon, Y-A-N-N-L-A-C-U-N. Uh, uh, he's from, uh, from France, uh, but was at Bell Labs for many years, and he is now considered the leading person in um, what are called neural networks. And neural networks are now driving everything they're doing at Facebook and, and, and Google, okay? Uh, he posts, I'd say, about 10 items a day on Facebook. So start following his feed. He's not gonna, you know, 
friend you probably, but um, uh, if you just follow stuff it, and, and just start reading these articles and like, you know, you'll, you'll get this huge, you'll just start to uh, build up this huge background knowledge about what's going on where, right, around, around the whole world in this. Uh, so, so, as I said, maybe you can just spend a little bit less, I don't know, does anybody use, you know, actually, any of the people in this room, you probably aren't like following TV shows or, or singers or anything. Um, but if you are, make, make room for Jan LeCun. And then, and then look at the people who comment on his posts who are often other very famous scientists, like Sebastian Thrun. Sebastian Thrun, who uh, invented the Google self-driving car and now has a, uh, an organization called Udacity, uh, T-H-R-U-N. Follow him, okay? And then you'll, you'll quickly branch out, just absorb a lot of knowledge, yes? Um, okay, boy, boy, that's, that's, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so you already have your PhD, so you don't really want to do, uh, another PhD. I would say the following is, um, in, um, the ideal thing, if, so do you have some, if you have some computational background, um, see if you could get a postdoc in, in a top level computer science group. So like a really highly ranked uh, department because, because the job market is so good right now, uh, actually even researchers who would like to hire a postdoc in computer science, they can't hire them because uh, they, they have, um, uh, you know, they're getting uh, real jobs. And, and a postdoc in a computer science lab, uh, we typically would pay like $65,000, $70,000 a year. So it's, it's not bad. So I would, um, <clears throat> I would uh, start looking for, for different researchers, target them, read about their research, find somebody who's doing something that, where it seems like some of your knowledge could help that effort, and then start, start writing letters, Does that, even out of the blue. And of course, networking. If you can find somebody who knows somebody who knows them, would be great. Great question. Um, yeah, I think we're in the informal discussion period. Um, so, uh, other, any uh, other other questions? Is there anything anything here that I said was any of it surprising or seem wrongheaded? It's possible that I, you know, as I said, this is GPA. what a three point five. Oh, well, I have to admit, I've only seen that happen once. <laughs> <laughs> but it really, and he was really, really good. He had published, he published like four papers as an undergraduate. Is that because he mainly focused on his research instead of getting good grades? Um, like yes, it, 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 was, it was part of that, and, and, and part of that is he was a very quirky individual um, who was full of quirks. Yeah, so he, <laughs> uh, he might get an A in something and then get a D in, in an English course, right? So he was very quirky kind of. Um, any, any, anything else? Yeah. Uh, where does, in terms of academic, in the academic side of things, where does uh, most of the research in data science get all the funding? Uh, oh, who's funding it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, medical applications are funded by National Institute of Health, and uh, everything else is pretty much funded by National Science Foundation in terms of. Uh, uh, and, and also, uh, sorry, National and uh, the Defense Department. So there's DARPA, um, there's all kinds of different acronyms now for parts of the, the Defense Department. So they probably fund about two-thirds from NSF, about a third, or maybe even a half from, from the military. And actually, the military ones, um, you don't actually have to create the system that, you know, creates a cyborg that destroys humanity. A lot of those people are really well-intentioned who run the programs. A lot of cybersecurity? Uh, actually, uh, uh, DARPA and IARPA are certainly investing a lot in cybersecurity. And um, yeah, and, and actually that's, that's, that's a great, and that certainly again is a, a dramatically expanding area. Uh, we need a lot, a lot of work um, 
We just had a talk last week by the former Secretary of the Navy about cybersecurity. He spoke down at the laser lab. Um, and it, it's really, it's really some come to everybody's attention now that the state of cybersecurity is, is really pitiful. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. What kind of advice you give her to sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, well, so your first I'd advise her to come uh, meet with uh, me or Michelle Vogel, who's the undergrad uh, undergraduate advisor for for data science. We always have time, and um, I'd say uh, there's a a couple of good introductory courses to find if, if, if she likes the, uh, the, the computing side. Of course, 161 uh, programming is called the Art of Programming. And um, it's very accessible, and I think it has a lot of fun projects. So that would be my advice, is try, take, try taking 161 and see how you like it. And, and then you know, stay in touch. Yes? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think would be the best kind of condensed <coughs> field guide style resources for data science for that type of person? Boy, that's a great question. I just haven't. Um, uh, I can't give you a quick answer because because uh, I, I, I honestly haven't haven't thought enough uh, about it. Um, in terms of resources. I, I guess I, I would again advise you come, you know, come talk to me, talk to, to Michelle um, about sort of where you are in in your current studies, how much time you have left, uh, and we can work and try to see well what what are uh, places we might want to uh, fill in. That might also be a great um, candidate for doing a master's program. We have a master's program too. So. If you were to say there's just one book, regardless of. What No, okay. no. There's no one book because it's there's too many different areas. I can name like a good book for machine learning or no, but nothing that really covers the whole field. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Does undergraduate research kind of offset not taking so many computer science and math courses? <coughs> um, yeah, as I said, I mean it, it 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 can help. I mean you certainly have to take some core computer science courses, I think. So if you're going to do a PhD in, to get into a computer science department, um, you don't necessarily have to be a computer science major, but we could talk about sort of what are this, some of the specific core courses that you might want to have beyond the introductory sequence. Other questions? Yeah. Um, do you recommend that an undergraduate potentially interested in research also maybe over the summer get experience with industry uh, th yeah, that that would be fine if you can if you can find uh, a, a good a good internship. Sure, sure. That 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 that's great. Um, yeah. The other thing I can say also is um, just again to educate yourself about the field. Go to uh, you know go to lots of talks and colloquiums and uh, I don't get a lot of people come to campus about things and then and then you might go to hear a talk and then. And there's something that intrigued you, but you didn't quite fully understand. And then you might go talk to a professor, say, you know, I, I just heard this talk about cybersecurity, and he was mentioning this. So t can you tell me more about that? Uh, but but sure, in, in internships are, are great too. Yeah. Hey, those summer research experience for undergrads, mm -hmm. do they like provide a stipend or? Um, they. I, no, no, no. They, they, they tend to be all nicely set up, right? And, and they tend to um, cover your expenses. Um, I, don't, I don't know if they all cover your travel expenses. They tend to cover, they, they usually put you up in a dorm and on the meal plan at the dorm and, and then you're there for like eight weeks. And there, and there also are a number of places, I said, in industry there used to be more, there's, there's um, you know, 
uh, you could try to be like, like that move the internship and apply to Google Labs. And they do, they do hire you know, undergraduate interns and they really do put you through a, um, a telephone interview process where they say, okay, you have 10 minutes to write a program to do this and, and do it and then, and then let's talk about it. Um, and I know students get, get jobs that way. Okay, well, I think, um, I think people are, are starting to uh, disperse. So, um, again, uh, thanks for coming. And <clears throat> so, so your, your, your first stop is uh, just Google Data Science University of Rochester. You find our webpage. And uh, Michelle Vogel, head of, uh, of our education programs uh, in CSB on the seventh floor. Okay, thanks.